just going to okay. go and lie down now. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. So um, you should now be able to see uh, my first slide. Yes. Yeah, type one uh, diabetes adults. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, when, when I was asked uh, when I'd like to talk uh, this year, I suggested April, um, hoping that NICE would keep to timetable and have their guidance uh, published. So um, it was published on time on the 31st of March. And um, in terms of uh, Libra use, it is uh, much more um, readily available now. So for those that don't know what a Libra is, I just want to click, quickly orientate you. So it's a way of measuring uh, glucose uh, with a disc in the arm and it has a tiny sensor on the end of it and that just sits just under the skin. Uh, it's only a few hairs breadth in width. And it's about four or five millimeters. You might have seen adverts on TV. So um, Abbott are advertising this directly to you guys. Um, and another version of a similar kind of product is Dexcom. So watch out for the two adverts. Um, and what it does with the handset that this girl is, you can see she's holding, um, all you do, it uses near field. So it's a bit like contactless uh, credit card payments and things. It transmits data to the, to the reader. And you can see on the reader display below that, it's given an idea of what the glucose is, 6.2. It's also got an upward arrow because it knows what the glucose was a few minutes ago. So it's a way of knowing what the glucose is at that time. But you'll also see that there's a wavy black line and that shows what the glucose has been uh, for the last few hours. So it's really useful in knowing where your glucose is, where it's going and where it's been uh, for the last few hours. Every time that you scan, as we say, which just means waving the reader or the phone over near the sensor, it transmits eight hours of information. So this is probably you know, the biggest innovation um, that's been routinely available now um, for, you know, in the last 10 years. Um, it is expensive compared to finger pricking. And that's why up till now, we've not been able to give it to everybody. So prior to COVID, we were asked to stick to the top 20% of people with type one diabetes that needed it. Because lots of people want it, but not necessarily really needed it. So we had to work this out in the most clinical need. Um, then COVID hit and up and down the country, um, people started prescribing it much more readily because all this data can go to the cloud. And that means that uh, we did lots of remote consultations where we could see people's glucose data and we're talking to them on the phone, for instance. So, you know, Astra and I have done a fair bit of that over uh, the last couple of years. And so up and down the country, 50% of adults with type 1 now have a Libra and the new type 1 guidance, you can see it was last updated in 2015. Libras weren't even mentioned at that point because they were just being launched. Um, but now all type 1s should be offered this. There's also another line there you say, you can see where it says, um, when choosing a kind of device, you need to work out what the, uh, identify what the person's needs and preferences are and offer them an appropriate device. Well, for the vast majority, a Libra is appropriate. And the newer version now also has alarms on it. So if your glucose is, is, is dropping, uh, it will beep at you, you can scan and see if your glucose is hitting the low threshold, which we would normally set around about 4.2 or 4, or you could, it could be meaning that you're hitting a high threshold, which um, for some people we set at 15 or 17. You don't want it to go off too often, otherwise you get alarm fatigue. So it's a bit like being constantly harassed with, I don't know if people on WhatsApp or Facebook, but you don't, you don't want to be harassed all the time. So there is a bit of skill of where you set the alarms. Um, it also says there you can see if multiple devices meet their needs and preferences, offer the device with the lowest cost. 
So NICE are always trying to work out what is cost effective for a population as a whole. And they've worked out that Libras are really cost effective for adults. The children's guidance is a little bit different. Um, what about type two diabetes? Uh, so people with type two diabetes, it again says offer this, but there's more caveats to this. So multiple daily injections, if any of the following apply. So not a one-off hypoglycemic event, but if there's recurrent hypoglycemia or if there's severe hypoglycemia. So severe doesn't in this case respond to the number. It actually means, did you need the help of somebody else to recover? And we unfortunately every week have some people admitted to hospital because they've had a severe hypo or they might have an ambulance call out. So that's what it means in this case, in the vast majority of cases. Um, if they have impaired hyper awareness with type two, then we can consider it. And I think where it will be really helpful across Sheffield is here, it's talking about people with a disability um, or cognitive impairment, so maybe dementia, that means they cannot self-monitor their glucose and they're reliant on other people. So uh, you may be aware of people that have spouses or elderly parents, for instance, or you know, children with uh, severe difficulties where actually doing finger pricks is a major, major hassle and they can be quite aggressive, for instance, and don't allow it. Um, so we've taught some of the district nurses how to do this and some community matrons, and now it means that we'll be able to prescribe it to people uh, in nursing homes or people that need district nurses to have their insulin injected for them. We'll be able to use that really uh, widely. So uh, that's a really good um, move. Interestingly, if you click on the hyperlinks, I've given you the, the website address. So if you click on the hyperlinks, it tells you exactly what they mean. So um, multiple daily insulin injections in the diabetes world usually means four injections a day, three, three injections for bolus insulin and one lot of background insulin. But in fact, they've divided defined it as two or more daily insulin injections. So it's a little bit broader than we were expecting, which is good because it opens up the field to people that are on twice a day insulins, um, probably mixed insulins, but are struggling. The guidance for children and young people uh, is a little bit different again. So uh, the evidence around that NICE could review, there's actually more evidence in continuous glucose monitoring. So just to try and explain the difference, the Libra is also called flash monitoring because you scan or flash the reader or the phone over the sensor, and then the information is on the phone. With a continuous glucose monitor, it literally sends the data there all the time. So you don't need to move your phone near the sensor. You just have your phone in the same room and you glance at your phone and then you know what your glucose is. So it's quite a, it sounds like quite a small difference, but in reality, it's about an extra thousand pounds to the NHS each year. So it is quite a big deal at the moment. The advantage of that is with these devices, the continuous glucose monitoring systems is that the alarms are better, they're, they're more accurate, um, but th there's also predictive low alarms. So I described with the Libra that it will let you know when your glucose has hit your low threshold, for instance. So your low threshold might be 4.2, the Libra will beep at you when you're 4.2 and you will scan and go, oh yes, it's below 4.2, I need to treat that hypo. A hypo is less than four, but you know, you've got impending hypo. With a continuous glucose monitoring system, because it's constantly monitoring it, it's also predicting where you're going to be in the next 20 minutes. So if it thinks you're going to have a hypo in the next 20 minutes, it will alarm at you. So for instance, your glucose might be 6.6, .6, but it could be dropping very rapidly. It would alarm at you at that point to say, please do something now before you have a hypo. And if any of you are looking after children or you know, think about your grandchildren, whatever, you can imagine how useful that would be 
to know that the child running around downstairs is actually about to have a hypo because you've looked at your phone, it's all on the cloud, they can have different followers. Uh, and so it's really useful in that situation, particularly also overnight. I guess, you know, Asta will have had plenty of parents who said they didn't really sleep worrying about their child going hypo overnight until they're on this kind of system where they could sleep through instead of getting up at 3 a.m. and checking that their glucose was okay with a finger prick. They could sleep through knowing that if the glucose was dropping, they'd have time to intervene uh, and stop the hypo actually happening. So first line for children is this continuous glucose monitoring. There's better evidence for it and potentially there's more to gain and you know little children can't even tell you when they're hypo can they 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 i guess become you know uh, badly behaved in some cases and then you think oh I wonder if they're hypo so that's some of the differences between the two in terms of what it means when you're on one of these systems over the next few years you're going to see a change in language whether you're you've got type one or type two diabetes. So now we're getting our heads around uh, the fact that we need to be talking about time in range and we're trying to train our, our healthcare professionals in this new lingo. So um, it's just to reassure you because some people think that their glucose needs to be really good all the time and thankfully it doesn't. So the recommended range between 3.9 and 10, you need to be there, if you can, 70% of the time. The hypos, which are red in all this kind of stuff now, because that, they're more dangerous in the acute setting, you only want 4% of your readings to be under 3.9 and only 1% of your readings under 3, because nobody's brain works very well with a glucose of less than 3, and obviously you have a lot more risk of uh, accidents and the like. So that means that you can have up to 30% of your readings above 10 and still have fantastic uh, diabetes control. They've recommended that you only aim for about 5% above 14, which might be just when you have a you know, particularly carby meal. Um, so please be reassured that you do not need to hit 100% uh, of the time. They think if we could get everybody to hit these targets, we would need far less clinics uh, for complications of diabetes. Astra and I would still have a job because there's such a huge amount of patients <laughs> to, to go at. So why, why are we talking now about time in range? We've got here some finger prick data on two different patients. They're each doing four finger pricks a day for 30 days. And I hope that you can see that the person on the left has better diabetes control than the one on the right. Yeah. There's a lot less variability. There are a lot less lows. There are a lot less highs. But they actually have the same HbA1c. And so what the HbA1c tells you about is just the mean glucose over three months, not just 30 days, but three months. But it doesn't tell you about the variability, it doesn't tell, me, tell you how many hypos they've had, doesn't tell you about how much hyperglycemia they've had. Oh, okay. Whereas the time in range, if you look at the number of points on the um, left-hand side, between four and 10 will be so much better than the time in range on the right. So it gives us extra information now. So for the recommended targets, I've, I've shown you the one on the left already. Um, for some high risk patients, we would relax this a bit. So high risk meaning perhaps elderly frail people or perhaps people coming towards the end of their lives. Um, where having a low HbA1c is less important because low HbA1c's are about uh, decreasing complications in the future. But if your future isn't very long, then we relax control. And we try to uh, avoid all hypoglycemia. So you should not have any readings under four. 
because you know they're horrible uh, feel horrible and there's just no need you'll also see on the right hand side that if you're pregnant that we have even tighter targets so you need 70 percent of the readings this time between 3.5 and 7.8 and this is to help make sure that the fetus uh, grows properly and that we have a healthy outcome so in terms of uh, technology the group that has the most to gain in a way are the pregnant women because they're looking after themselves and a fetus so they get best tech they were the first group to be identified that could have the continuous glucose monitoring And so you will hear people talking about, well, your timing range last time was so-and-so, and now it's this. And it's so important because we know that you only need a 5% increase in your timing range. And if you can maintain that over a prolonged period of time, then that has clinically significant benefits further down the line in that you will have uh, less complications. So the two go hand in hand. If you increase your timing range, you will improve your HbA1c. And I've already said that it doesn't need to be perfect. So, you know, 50% timing range, 12 hours a day. People that are hitting the 70% timing range and haven't got it in target the entire time, it's, you know, just under 17 hours a day. And you can see the, the timing range and what kind of HbA1c you might expect. Um, this was an American paper, so they've been sensible and stuck to the old percentages. And I put in the minimal version that you know, we've been made to force to go over in the UK. And for most people, if you look across large studies, if you get a 10% increase in your timing range, then it leads to a drop in HbA1c in old money of about 0.5%. Which, which is 5.5 .5 millimoles in new money. That's nice. So a 10% increase is really uh, helpful. And if you keep thinking about times, um, then in terms of hypoglycemia, uh, I said earlier, we don't want it to be any more than 4% over 24 hours. Well, that's an hour. So within... 24 hour period, you shouldn't be hypoglycemic for more than an hour uh, in total. And for the more frail people, just 1% is just 15 minutes. So this is what we should be aiming with all our um, interactions with people like yourselves to reduce the amount of time spent hypo to less than one hour a day. I've prepared these slides for a talk in a, in a few days time and actually I thought the message is uh, would be helpful for you that you don't have to go from 30% time and range to 70% time and range overnight. That's not how it works. You need to make small steps um, because we know each 5% increase time and range is really helpful. And effectively, that means 75 minutes. If maths isn't a strong point, we'll just think about an extra hour a day. An extra hour a day, time and range, is really helpful moving forward, less complications. The thing that um, we need to help people with diabetes do more often is to reflect on their glucose levels. And having continuous data for some people can be quite overwhelming. There's an awful lot of data to look at. Um, that sometimes just seeing that squiggly line on a Libra or CGM can really help and people can see what kinds of things make their glucose go up. So uh, one of the things that Astra and I do is spend a lot of time looking for patterns. So we start at the kind of, if you look here, just beyond the green arrow, we try to identify issues in glucose. So we try and see where the biggest problem is. And uh, in clinic yesterday, uh, I had a, a young girl and uh, the biggest issue was that she wasn't checking her glucose um, before she went to bed. So she was always waking up high. So you identify the biggest issue. You then think about well, what are the causes of that? Why is she quite often waking up high? The answer was because she wasn't checking before bed. 
And then we talked about possible solutions to that and trying to link helpful behaviors um, to that. So we suggest some options and with the uh, patient, we try to get them to agree to tackle one aspect of it. And then the next job is to say in a week's time or so, did it make any difference? So just as an example, it could be that your glucose is always high at lunchtime. Why does that happen? It could be that the quick acting dose of insulin at breakfast is too low. It could be that your background dose of insulin is too low, but you, you think about different options. It could be that you forgot to bolus with your breakfast. So um, this, you know, some of the solutions here we've said is already increase the ratio. It could be that you eat more carb than you do normally. It could be that you need to test out the dose of the background insulin. So let's decide that you decide to increase the breakfast ratio. The next job is to actually evaluate, is the lunchtime glucose better? So we're trying to get people to identify patterns in their glucose, come up with a solution, test it out, but then to have another look in a few days time, what effect did that change have? Uh, interestingly, one of the girls I saw last week, uh, she's not been trained in the UK, and I said, what do you do if your glucose is a bit high? And she said, I go for a walk. So she was doing what you did, Shirley, but she just got so used to, if her alarm went off and her glucose was 11, um, she's got a bit of a choice of how she structures her day. She said, I'd rather go for a walk than do another insulin injection. You know, brings her glucose down. So it worked for her. So time in range is actually more helpful than HbA1c for feedback as well. So this is why I wanted to spend a bit of time just talking about time and range um, at, at this point. Looking at your time and range, if you've got one of these uh, devices, is really cheap. It doesn't hurt. And you can check it at any time. So you look on your reader, you look on your phone, and you can see what your time and range has been, not just today, but perhaps for the last week, for the last two weeks. And, sorry, this slides haven't worked quite right. There we go. And the time in range, if you make a, a change to your behavior or a change to your ratio or change to, I don't know, start weighing your carbs with your evening meal, for instance, you will notice a significant change in your time and range over a, a two week period. So you could decide to change something. I'm gonna see if that makes my time and range go up. Whereas before, you'd have to wait three months, organize a blood test, and then see what happens to your HbA1c. So as a feedback process, that's not very helpful. You want to know if something, if a change that you've decided to make has actually worked, and time and range allows you to do that very quickly. So just to summarize, even a 5% increase is important, and uh, that equates to about 75 minutes. Um, I talked a bit, little bit right at the beginning about how is CGM different to Libra. So I just wanted to summarize it here. Um, there's no need to scan. It just goes to your phone the entire time. Um, because of the slightly different products, CGM is licensed elsewhere. So um, the most common um, CGM is Dexcom, the other one that's advertised on TV. And for instance, children can wear it on the top of their buttocks. So it's quite good. It doesn't really get caught uh, on their arms or on things like that. You can also customize the alarms a bit more. So I have some patients that have their low glucose alarm set at five during the day because they're busy driving, whereas they're quite happy to have their alarm at four overnight. Um, and sorry, I've got a child trying to join in if somebody <laughs> just wants to mute. Um, unless they know a lot about diabetes. Um, so yeah, you can have the, the alarm set at different levels. I've talked about this predictive low alarm. There's also extra alarms that you can set if the glucose is rising or falling very rapidly. 
Uh, and one of the big advantages, particularly for the Astis cohort, is that you can have a number of followers. So we, we do have a young lady um, who's under our care now. Uh, she has Down syndrome. Uh, she can't tell people when she's hypo. Um, but that data, she just has the phone with her all the time. She knows to carry it around with her. She doesn't mind it. It's in her posh handbag. Um, and then her sister and both parents are following her, her Dexcom data. So they know to help her if her glucose goes low. Um, CGM, you can download to some other um, websites. So you can download it not only to the product specific one, but also to Diasend and Gluco. Gluco are taking over Diasend. Um, and so that helps us. We've used Diasend in the Sheffield clinics for years and years. And I've said here, greater interoperability. So that means that it will talk to um, some of the devices and different pumps. And it is the first step to a closed loop. So we, we've, got a, we've got a problem in that now NICE have told us that we need to offer Libras to everybody and think about which people uh, should have a, a Dexcom, which is effectively twice the price. Um, and so we've got to work out how we're going to prioritise. And um, we think, well, we ought to concentrate particularly on uh, adults where scanning is difficult, that they forget to scan every eight hours because they don't understand. Um, there are other people, as I've already said, pregnant ladies get the CGM version because it's more accurate and helps them stay in range better. We do need to help those people with uh, where their warnings of hypos are severely impaired or if they're having lots of severe hypos because it has the predictive lows on. So those are the people that we're going to uh, prioritise. I've got about another five or so slides and then I'm happy to take some questions and comments from Asta. Mm -hmm. So the next step um, is a closed loop. And if you were listening to the Today program on April the 1st, I don't know why they announced this on April the 1st, Asta, it was one of your uh, colleagues was talking about the hybrid closed loop study. And this involves having a sensor, so not a Libra this time, because it, it's not licensed for that. So this is using a, a Dexcom. Uh, the Dexcom, you can have results on your phone. So that bit is very similar to a, um, a Libra. You can also have a receiver. If you've got a posh Apple Watch and the like, you can have your glucose readings on your, on your watch. Um, the difference is that this has the capability to tell this pump over here how much uh, insulin to give. So with an insulin pump, I'm just going to explain the basics just very quickly. An insulin pump only has quick acting insulin in it. So if you were on, let's say, 26 units of background insulin, so something like Traceba, Tegero, Levomir, whatever your favorite background insulin is, if you moved on to a pump, we would program it to deliver one unit of insulin every hour. So it only has quick acting insulin in it. And then when you are about to eat, you would tell the pump how much carb you're going to have. So let's say I know, 40 grams at lunchtime. It would already know what your ratio is. So different people have different ratios. So it might be the most common one is that most people need one unit per 10 grams. So it would think, ah, you're having 40 grams, your ratio is one to 10, a four unit bolus, and it would suggest a four unit bolus. If your glucose was already high at that time, so let's say it was 12, it would already know what your correction factor is your, or your sensitivity factor. So most people, the type one diabetes need one unit to drop their glucose by three. And so it, it would do the maths instantaneously. It would think, well, we want your glucose to be six, but your glucose is actually 12. So you need 
two units to get your glucose from a 12 to a six, and you need four units for your 40 grams of carb. So it would suggest to you six units of insulin. And you would press the button on the pump to say, yes, I'm happy that six units of insulin is what I need. So that's what a pump does. And it just delivers this, uh, this picture hasn't got some tubing on it, but there's a little bit of tubing coming out of the pump and there's a tiny needle that just sits under the skin. With a closed loop or artificial pancreas as it's also known as, the Dexcom tells the pump when the glucose is going up and gets it to infuse or inject the insulin that bit quicker. It can also tell the pump when the glucose is dropping too quickly and it can slow down the rate at which glucose is being infused or indeed stop it for a time. So what it does is smooth out that variability. So there are less lows, there are less highs, and there's a greater time in range. So it is kind of the holy grail that we've been waiting for for years and years. The first trials of this were about 40 odd years ago. It's taken this long to actually get the technology reliable enough to give a life-saving drug um, you know, on a continuous basis with a good enough sensor and a pump that's not so big that you can't carry it around unlike the first ones. Um, on the current systems, you do need to tell it when you're having some carb because carbohydrate makes your glucose go up so very quickly um, that the system tries to compensate, um, but it's not quite good enough yet. And it might be quite some time before we have a commercially available system that can cope with that. So we really do need people to have a go at carb counting and to understand it. It's a little bit more forgiving that if you thought you were going to have 40 grams of carb, but you actually at 50, then the pump would speed up a bit and just think, oh no, it's still going up. Even though I've delivered the six units that we thought, it would deliver a bit more um, because in fact, you'd have 50 grams, not 40. Similarly, if you didn't eat all your meal and left a bit and you only had 32 grams, it would be slowing down the rate of the background rate that's going through the pump to protect you from hyperglycemia. So it does mean that you, you don't need to be quite as accurate with your carb counting and you can still get reasonable results. However, if you are very good at carb counting, you'll get even better results. And those kinds of people are getting 80, 85% of all their readings uh, with, in the range of four to 10. So we're very fortunate in Sheffield that the adult service and the pediatric service were both asked to take part in this NHS uh, pilot uh, funded by NHS England. And what uh, May was talking about on the, on the 1st of April was the fact that we've got uh, something like 820 patients up and down the country who are testing this system out and based on how well they do, so not just um, HbA1c, that's one of the things we were looking at, but we're also looking at rates of hospital admissions, we're also asking about diabetes distress, um, uh, things like retinopathy, if that progresses. So there's a number of things being taken into account. Um, NICE will then decide who we fund closed loops in uh, as a society. The criteria were a little bit different for adults and children. So I'll let Asa tell you about the children's uh, results. But for us in, in the adult world, we were only allowed to recruit people that were already on a pump with an HB1C of 70 or more, and those that were on a Libra and a pump, but still got this higher HB1C. And this is um, two weeks of readings of our first patient went on to this. So uh, he went on it on the 3rd of, February, uh, 3rd of September, but for the two weeks before he was wearing a Dexcom, before that he was wearing uh, a Libra. So this is his Dexcom data. You can see that his average glucose is well above 10, um, is fairly steady. Um, the alarms are working well. He's not having uh, too many hypos, but his timing range is only 39% and we want it to be 
This is his data from the first two weeks of being on this system where the Dexcom is controlling his pump and changing the rate of infusion according to his glucose. So he'd not been seen by any healthcare professionals between here and here. And you can see that this line is now virtually all the time below 10. The bars give you an idea of how much error there is. Um, what these systems are really good at is getting your glucose to a lovely range when you crawl out of bed. And so every day now, the two weeks when he's getting out of bed, his glucose is you know, about a six or seven. So sleeping much better, starting the day very well. Um, so it is uh, really life-changing for people that are, have gone on this system. It's a little bit complicated though, what me and Asta have to do in clinic. So I'm gonna try and talk you through this, but don't worry if you don't understand um, all the ins and outs, because it, it takes some going. If we start at the bottom, the blue line, this wavy blue line is what the pump is delivering. And where it's flat is where we had pre-programmed his pump. So I said for some people that have a unit an hour, well, it looks like, um, I'll call him Fred, his name's not Fred. It looks like Fred needs 0.6 units an hour. So this is what was pre-programmed. But at times where his glucose is going high, like here, it suddenly increases the rate. And then as his glucose was dropping quite quickly, you can see the blue line goes down to zero. And we've got a pink line and it's actually stopped giving insulin at this point. So this blue line is going up and down throughout the 24 hour period. And you'll see that where this is high, the glucose is high. In the evening, he probably had a bit to eat here. His glucose is going up and down. The machine is making all these decisions independent of Fred. The bit that Fred has done is tell it on two occasions when he was having carbs. So the carbs are these green triangles. So he told it some carb at seven o'clock in the morning. It was actually 7.04, it tells us over here. He told it 45 grams and uh, the pump gave five units. For his tea, he was having 69 grams. He's obviously on a one to 10 ratio. It gave 6.9 units. So these are the two times where he's interacted with it. The blue squiggly line is doing it the rest of the time and it can give some tiny little boluses if it wants down there. But that's all basically to try and keep this squiggly line within the green region between four and 10 for as long as it can. What does that mean moving forward? Well, you've already seen this picture, but the arrow down the left-hand side tells you what his HbA1c did. So within three months, his HbA1c had gone from 71 down to 48. And uh, I think we just, we saw him at about three weeks and then we saw him at three months. So some people have needed more adjustments um, to the pump settings and other people have not managed, we've not needed to um, make many adjustments. Um, I showed you the first patient, but in fact, I could have shown you another 25 that did really well. We've got two people where it didn't make a big difference. I don't think we've seen those two individuals quite often enough to optimize their settings. But the other 25 uh, have done really well. So you can see here, I said that everybody had to have an HP1C above 70 for us. So the average was 79. And at three months, the average had dropped down to 59. And some of those people we've now seen at six months, including Fred, and that average is uh, maintained. So it's a massive drop in HbA1c. Um, they feel so much better. Their glucose is more stable uh, and they're not needing to think about their glucose nearly uh, as much. I have two slides left, just to warn you. 
if you're just wondering how long she's going to go on and on and on. So that technology is still being evaluated. Originally, NICE said that they would um, announce who would be eligible for a closed loop um, in April 2022. However, I've checked the website today. It now says that the committee is meeting once just before Christmas, again in February 23. Um, they're not going to announce anything this side of April Fool's Day next year, I don't think. Um, so, and it's because I think the stumbling block is they know it's really expensive and they want to evaluate it very, very carefully. Um, so that's kind of like the high tech end of where we are down to the lower tech end, and this is available to uh, everybody who injects insulin. So we have, have now uh, what are called smart pens. And this smart pen isn't so smart that it knows how much you need to inject for your dinner, but it will help um, you remember what dose you gave. So the top number tells you the dose that you last gave, and the time since you last gave it. So, um, and it holds the last 800 doses. You just press the top and you see the last one, but you can download it. Again, it's using near field technology. So you can download this um, to smart phones or we can download it in clinic. The, this is the Novo Pen 6. There's also a version called Novo Pen Echo Plus, if you're on very small doses of insulin and you need half unit increments. Um, at present, uh, Novo have got their pens to market first, they've done all their testing and got CE marks. So you need to be on Novo insulins in order to use these Novo pens. If you're on uh, Lily insulins or uh, uh, other insulins made by Sanofi. They do have their pens coming out, but I don't know the dates. So it's very difficult for companies to gauge when the regulatory authorities are going to say, yes, we've checked your product and it's safe to go. So for some people, I think it probably is worth switching insulins because they have problems with remembering if they give their dose. Um, I'm fortunate I, I don't need to take any medication, but there's not anybody that I've offered this to in clinic that has not thought it a good idea. So I'm not having a go at the clientele that are on the line, just saying that, you know, I think you're a bit forgetful. I think anybody can forget or not be 100% sure if they really did give their quick acting insulin with their lunch because they got a bit distracted and now they're doing something else. And uh, one of the girls the other week, who's now 27, she went, oh God, definitely need one of those. She'd given two lots of her background insulin uh, on one day. And of course she'd spent the next 48 hours being hypo most of the time, getting her glucose up and then needing to treat it. So um, if you know of anybody that's on insulin, do mention um, this to them because um, we've got loads in the diabetes center. We can just give them out and uh, we're passing on details along with the company to GPs, so that GPs will now be able to prescribe uh, these for you. So the last slide just shows what you would do in order to download it. Literally, you just hold the pen near your phone and depends on how many doses you've got on there, but it just sends it all to the cloud. And what you see are these bolus doses here in the different colors for your quick acting and different, a darker color for your background insulin. Um, and we can see all those on Diasend and you can have a look. So for some people um, already, it's been really helpful for us to explain to them. For instance, we can see that perhaps these bars have occurred after the glucose has risen. So we've said, mm, do you sometimes give your bolus insulin after you've eaten? If you give it before, then the, the uh, rise in the glucose is a lot less. So those are the kinds of things that we're looking at in clinic, as well as 
patients having the certainty as to when they last get their uh, last injection. So I'm going to stop sharing. And then um, obviously happy to take uh, any questions or do you want to ask her to just talk about the things that are slightly different for children? Is that a good time now? And then we just have a free for all for questions. Uh, yes, that's that's fine by me. <laughs> Anybody else got any objection? It's just that Aston might answer some of the other questions that people have got in their minds. So, uh... Thanks, yeah. Becky. I think you've covered the difference in NICE guidance for children, which is basically us, like NICE recommends offering continuous glucose monitoring first and then flash or Libra if that's unacceptable to the young person. So that's the main difference between adults and children. And in terms of, I think, closed loop trial are, so in the children, we've recruited about 250 children uh, all over the country on this closed loop trial. And criteria for children and young people was, was a little bit different as anybody with HPA1C of less than 48 was eligible to go on this trial. They had to be wearing either a continuous glucose monitor. Sorry, Astra, above 48, you mean? Yeah, I'm sorry, above, did I say below? Above yeah. 48. <laughs> so they had to be wearing either flash or a CGM three months prior to going on to the uh, trial so that we had a prelim data. And similarly, as with adults, I think we only have three months data so far for children. And it's, it's, uh, it's looking really good. So time in range, I think, improved from 48 or 49% to 65%. And HbA1c has dropped from a mean of 62 millimoles to 54, looking at the prelim data. Obviously, we haven't done all the uh, quality sort of questionnaire, like quality of life and diabetes distress type questionnaires yet, because that to be done at the end of six months. And so I think that those were the main differences. And looking at the question, I, I don't know if you want to do them later, there are some questions about if children could be offered a hybrid closed loop. So I, I don't know, do you want me to answer that now or we could do later or? Um, you could answer it now while it's yeah. while you've while you've said so, it, you might yes. as well so, you might stop finish. <laughs> So actually, I don't know who or where that questions come from. So we are offering a hybrid closed loop therapy for children in the UK and our uh, unit in official uh, children's diabetes team, we've got loads of kids on um, um, T-Slim with Dexcom. So only uh, I think problem or basically limitation is that these uh, devices are not licensed for very young children. So T-Slim pump with Dexcom is licensed for six and under and the hybrid closed loop algorithm only works if they're on minimum of 10 units. And we, there is another system, which is like a DANA pump, which is a different pump, which works with Dexcom, but they have to have an Android phone where, which hosts the algorithm. So they have to have three devices with them. With that system is called KMAP, KMAPX and it's developed in Cambridge. So it's developed in, within the UK. And that's licensed for one year and above. And the children, those little ones, have to be on about five units of insulin per day for that to work as a hybrid closed loop. Yeah, I think that's. Thank you. Thank you. So we've got one hand up, which is Martin. Do you want to ask a question, Martin? And then we'll go to the ones that's uh, been sent in prior. So you're on mute, yeah. Martin. So that's it. Yeah. Um... One for Jackie, really. Um, you mentioned that you're going through and deciding which patients get the Libre and which get the CGM because of the cost. Um, am I right you said that? We're, we're bearing the cost in mind. So, um, yeah. The... Can, I just in, can mm. I just interrupt? Mm. Sorry. Mm. Okay. Part of CAR, uh, Diabetes Specialist for NHS England, mm has said that commissioners and consultants should not be making any decision, decisions about costing because it's already been done independently by NICE. 
and no barriers should be put in the way. So the work's already been done. And he said uh, to me, and also on Twitter, in a gentle and polite reminder to commissioners, mm. that cost-effective work has been done. So commissioners of CCGs, uh, CGMs, C CCGs, sorry, and also clinicians should not bear cost in mind. It's not your job to do. Your job is just to get the best product for the patient. I actually am on a DIY closed loop. I've been doing it for two years. I've been 67 years diabetic. Mm -hmm. um, so I've seen things come and go. And this is dear to my heart that everyone should be offered a CGM if they want it. I, I'm not under you um, at all, nope. your, your, your hospital. Um, and my hospital has in principle um, agreed before the NICE made a definite um, commitment to this um, that I could go on to Dexcom if I wanted. I'm on Libre 2 at the moment with a Donna um, RS pump and I self loop using yeah. various various devices to convert that so I could manage it from my phone. Um, but part of car, he's really hot on this and he's giving CCGs three to four months to sort themselves out. And then he will be naming and shaming um, CCGs that do not comply. Mm. So there are lots of considerations, um, Martin, so, so thank you. The, what NICE do is come up with guidance. So it's not quite law, uh, it is guidance. And so we have to be mindful that there is a cost associated with this. You do not, according to Parthen, he has said the cost effectiveness work has already been done and it is not your job. This is to the, to the commissioners. Mm. But he also said a similar thing in another tweet for consultants. It is not your job to do so again. And RCT has shown that uh, quality of adjusted life year of 5K has been proved. And Dr. Paul Chris, director, at the Centre for Guidelines has also said that an independent committee has recommended this. Mm. Yeah. So you shouldn't be taking making cost um, into account at all. It's so not your job. Okay, but and there is a but here. The CCG has to find some extra money in order. But it's to not do your this. job to bother or their job where to find money they're, they're ending soon no 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 it the, is the, the commissioners are going the, the commissioners need the money before they can spend it yes but they it's been, they, it's they, been they have over not a period been, this, yes this is cost effective yes i agree i agree with all that martin over a period of time it is cost effective but it doesn't help the CCG balance their books between now and the end of the financial year. Uh, so, for instance, people in Sheffield, I don't know about surrounding areas, but across the country, about 50% of type one uh, people have access to a Libra at the minute. It's 60% now, CCGs and Libra. Is, um... CGMs and Libra is now 60%. Yeah, I agree if you add the CGM in, but and we, we do use quite a bit of CGM in Sheffield. So we've got, tw we've got 1,200 in Sheffield uh, out of a total of 2,700 odd patients with uh, type 1 diabetes. We've probably got, got about 200 in CGM. Um, so that means that about half the type 1 population is not yet even on a Libra. And that they're not on a pump either. Um, so pumps cost 
about an extra two and a half, three thousand pounds per year in consumables. Uh, the CGM devices cost about an extra two thousand pounds per year. And moving a thousand or twelve hundred patients onto Libra that haven't got any of the devices yet will cost Sheffield CCG an extra million pounds that they need to find this financial year. Some of the savings that NICE has used for their evaluation don't come within that first 12 months. So yeah. they need to find an extra million pounds even if we only get Libra to 1,200 patients that are not currently on a pump or anything. Yeah. So, so they're, they're my priority. So I, I'm trying I, to look after I the people of, that, of Sheffield as a whole. Yeah, I realise that not everybody's going to get it straight away. I mean, it took me a year before I could get Libre, the original mm. Libre, uh, from when it was announced in the Daily Mail. Um, but the commissioners have been told that they should not be doing any cost-effective analysis and we're not or, 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 but literally or, they want to know where to find the money so what we need is pressure on the department of health to actually say where's that million pounds coming for for sheffield for this year it's only one year it's an extra one million pounds for this year so our drug budget roughly for sheffield um pre-covid i haven't heard the figures but pre-covid it was about 100 million pounds was our drug budget we're about to increase that by a million mm. by only offering libra to those that don't have it or for the people with type twos and recurrent hypos or type twos in a nursing home so that's not me trying to do a cost effectiveness analysis that's me no, just no. going actually please give me a million pounds what i'm going to do with your first million that you give me is get Libra to the widest population that I can, because I think that that will help 1,200 patients enormously. Yeah, yeah, I understand all that, but it's still been said that you shouldn't be worrying about the cost effectively. If, if a patient comes to you and he can say, I'm better off with a Dexcom than a Libre, then you should provide that, because the, the wording of the NICE also say uh, to the effect that agreeable between the parties mm, it does say that you know, i agree so, you know it, it's, it's good good to have this chat with you and see mm. your point of view but I'm, I'm still going on the side that you shouldn't be worried about in your individual patients about cost yeah, it's, it, it is really difficult because also if they push me and say okay that's another million pounds no idea where that's coming from do you want to give up some staff to pay for that because there is a finite pot so if mm. we drag a million pounds out of the sheffield ccg pot somewhere else is going to suffer well, the next next year we're going to get loop pumps coming in as well and that well and and that looks like it's going to be a similar thing to the CGC GMs. So. It, it'll be a huge cost, which oh. is why I think. So it'll have to be funded. It's got to be funded from somewhere. Oh. Government's got to pay for it. Basically, you know, between us, we don't pay enough tax for the health system that we would all like. I would love closed loops to be available for, you know, thousands of people. Oh. It's, I think the closed loop is going to be even tighter um than cgm and libras it will come in time and the good thing is that we've just basically talked about two different sensors um they're both working very hard to compete against each other which is good to because it means cost down it'll drive the cost down yeah. and it will mean that a million pounds will go a lot further yeah so um it's it's might be let's just wait and see because the price could come down of these two products that we're talking about even within this next year because yeah. it is a big market and, and the companies are in it to make money so mm. um they they will have a bit of a price war i think and that's only good for patients yeah. well the libre 3 is actually a cgm 
and at the moment they haven't reduced that no and it doesn't it doesn't control a pump so that's not so helpful at the uh, moment it the diy community is working on it to break the code yeah yeah it, the diy <laughs> will work but there won't be a, a commercial not, not the assistant yeah anyway thank you very much okay good thank you thank you martin that was a very interesting uh, discussion so have we got any of the uh, written uh, questions lindsay um because i'm recording i can't access them so <laughs> i need jackie um, and Asta to put them in the chat box if you if you can but i think you've answered some mm. already let's have, have a look what's in the chat box uh, yeah i can't just ha have a spin down it um so I think a couple of them was regarding the last subject was, uh, so what happens when the money runs out? Do some patients then get neither Libra 2, no Dexcom? Mm. So that's obviously the position that I don't want to get to where they're going to yeah. say to me, well, which services are you going to cut? Which staff are you going to give up? Um, I don't want to get into those discussions. Mm. So I'm just trying to be mindful and make limited money go as far as it uh, can. Uh, Lindsay's just asked me to clarify what a bolus is. So yes. bolus, um, I was meaning, is a dose of insulin that you give um, either for a correction because your glucose is high, but particularly you bolus insulin with food. So you bolus quick acting insulin. Um, and um, most people, if they've got type one, will be on a background insulin that is just a very slow insulin that you give either once or twice a day. Whereas uh, people with type 2 diabetes are more often, but not always, uh, on a mixed insulin. So something like uh, Humulin M3 is 30% quick acting, 70% medium acting. It's already mixed together. Um, so we don't tend to talk about boluses of mixed um, insulin quite so much because you give it at fixed times a day and they're fixed doses. But yeah, a bolus to cover carbohydrate. Um, and then there was a question about the, the older patients. I did, we don't tend to go directly on age as opposed to more frailty. So for those times in range, uh, it said for older, frail people, it, said, it actually said high risk. High risk people, you want 1%, no more than 1% uh, below four, and to relax it to 50%. Uh, in time and range between four and ten uh, as a target and we think that that means that probably your average glucose runs somewhere around about I don't know, 12 or so but you're not very likely to have hypos you're not very likely to have high glucose levels of 20 or more that are making you symptomatic so that you're running to the loo and thirsty and can't sleep so uh, those are the kind of levels that we would use um, as I said, perhaps for people nearing the end of their lives, or if people had recurrent falls. So if you're hypo in, the, in older people, we worry about some people do fall over because they have hypos. So we cut out the hypos and we cut out some of the falls and obviously fractured hips and a long stay uh, in Northern Germany is not what we want for anybody. Um, there was a question about if Lily produced a smart pen. Lily, uh, have got a pen it's just not been launched so if people want to go back to humalog then yes um there's not much difference in the price between um nova rapid and humalog uh, so if one insulin suits better than the other then uh, there's no reason why people um shouldn't uh, switch back uh, there's a comment about it's great that so many people have, have libra um, I, I mean, I, I do think there probably is a um, patient power. Um, there's, there's definitely a role for that to say, you know, this nice guidance it, it is great. Um, will NHS England produce more money to support CCGs to deliver it? Um, we've not even talked about the cost of supporting people on. 
uh, closed loops because obviously there's a lot more time involved in, in getting people onto pumps and making sure that they're safe and doing the troubleshooting, making sure that the, the settings are just right. Um, we're trying not to get to a postcode lottery. Um, so we are um, trying to, you know, do things across the entire patch. So from July, CCGs go. They were meant to go before COVID, but it kind of got in the way. So we moved to um, bigger systems, integrated care systems, and we saw as much as we can try to align across all the uh, integrated care systems to make sure that um, people are being treated in, in the same way. Um, Um, the good news for people that are self-funding Dexcom is I think the price will come down. So hopefully um, that that position will will change. Um, there was a what's your favourite bit of kit? Um, my favourite bit of kit at the minute after. Uh, a Libra device is these new smart pens um, because everybody uh, that I've given them to just goes oh that makes sense you know because everybody but everybody at some point has thought did I give that injection or didn't I um, and then the kind of added bonus is for when people can either download them directly onto their phone or bring them to clinic and we can download them and really see how often they are giving insulin. Some people um, think they're giving insulin more often than they do. Tell me that they never miss a dose. But um, I mean, that's one of the advantages of being on a pump. When we download the pumps, we can see exactly what insulin has been given. Um, but it doesn't have to be done. You know, it can just be done in a supportive way. One of the girls yesterday, um, when we looked at when she'd used the pen, um, literally, she'd just forgotten to give her bolus for the breakfast, and the glucose of five had gone to 15 with her cereal bowl. So it's just reassuring to say it's not that your diabetes is rubbish or that it can't be controlled. You just simply forgot that bonus insulin. So here's a pen, it might help you remember a bit more of the time. Uh, they come in different colors, so we make sure that you have different colors for your quick acting and for your longer acting. And if you've got a really complicated regime and you're on a mixed insulin as well, we can give you a different color pen for that as well. Thank you, David. I think you've got a question. You've got your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just, I had a question about recycling all of this medical mm. equipment, the, 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 Dexcom, you can see that big hand thing that you inject with, and the, the Libras also come with with a huge plastic workload lo load. So, mm. um, have, do you have anything within the hospital that handles, collects, or whatever, or does anything with it? All I've seen is that um, the Libra people will take their, their their trash back, as it were, and they'll burn it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, in terms of uh, the companies are very aware of this and they are they are trying to come up with different ways of doing it. So Libra and Dexcom have the issue of trying to get as many people to use this as possible. So making the insertion device easy, having a needle fire into your arm leave a tiny filament behind and then the needle retracts and it disappears into that plastic gubbins so that you, you, you don't see the needle. If somebody picked it up after you'd put your sensor in, you know, they couldn't harm themselves. Um, but they are aware there's a lot of plastic waste. So the new versions coming out, the Libra 3 has less plastic. The new uh, Dexcom G7 has less plastic. The, um, I, I talked about these uh, smart pens in Sheffield, and I, I don't know if it's the same up and down the country, but we've got ourselves into the position where 
two thirds of all insulin prescriptions are in disposable pens. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know how it's happened. We've only got one third of, of people prescriptions across Sheffield, across all insulins, uh, being in reusable pens. So when I've offered these smart pens to people, I've talked about you know the added benefit of it reminding you of the last dose and the last time. But for some people, it's saying, you don't really need disposable pens, do you? There's very few people where it actually makes that amount of difference. So convincing them instead to go onto cartridges um, and just say it cuts down on plastic waste. And everybody's just nodded and going, yeah, of course it makes sense. So they're sick of throwing away their plastic insulin pens, which is good. Um, Novo have actually a recycling scheme. So if we have people that need disposable pens, perhaps for a different reason, um, or if we have people that are on a GLP-1 analogue that's um, injected in a Nova pen, so a Zempic, um, they're rolling out a recycling uh, procedure. So in the diabetes centre, we can give you a box. It's a cardboard box. It's a flat pack. You make it into a little box. You can put in your 12 um, Azempic pens as you collect them over the months, and then literally just drop that um, box into any Royal Mail postal box. Um, it's free post, gets to uh, Novo somewhere. They put it on a lorry that's going to a port anyway because these boxes are quite tiny compared to everything else. So they've convinced some people to transport these boxes onto uh, a shipping container that's going back to Scandinavia anyway, um, you know, for whatever other reason. They've then developed, they spent millions of pounds developing a plant that will take those pens to pieces, take out the 17 different component parts and make blue plastic chairs uh, or light bulbs or both. So the companies are working on this very hard. And uh, just to scare you, if we don't do something about this over the next 10 years, we will have uh, used enough pens to circle the globe 28 times. And at the minute in Sheffield, we have two thirds of all pens um, that are disposable pens either going into landfill or going into sharp spins and then being incinerated. So thank you, David, for uh, reminding me to, to mention this. We are, we are having a drive on this. Uh, I've shared um, that data with the CCG. Um, GPs are feeling really pressurised at the minute, but there's nothing to stop any of you guys going, I want one of these new pens. They're now on prescription. Um, or if your GP is not listening, contact us directly um, and we'll put some to one side for you to collect from the Diabetes Centre. I can see Brenda raising a hand. Oh, Brenda. Oh, hi, Brenda. I can't see you, Brenda. Where are you? <laughs> you oh, Brenda was across the top of the screen. Yeah. But right. I don't know if there's any yellow hands up, but I saw Brenda yeah. waving her yeah. real you hand. Might let me to ask this question, but it's about the Nova Pen. I realise that uh, Nova Pen 5 is also a smartphone and Nova Pen 6, but um, you said you can download it at the hospital, the data. Is there any way that we can then get that back to us? Um, I'd say I was disappointed. I've got a Nova Pen 6 and I thought I was going to be able to download the data. Um, I'm still struggling to find out um, what to get a new smartphone or something that will let me use it that's got the NFC on it. Um, and I do think that perhaps in future you could warn people about this. You know, if you're going to go on to this sometime in the future, next time you get a new smartphone, look out for the M NFC. Um, yeah. But in the shorter term, um, to me, it, it's not, I don't want to know six months or a year later that I, I didn't actually inject that insulin or that I had extra, um, you know, or that I did inject it and didn't put it into my, um, into my Libra. I need to know fairly soon after the event to be able to learn from it. Certainly anything a week later, you know, that's gone. That was the week that was, let it go. Um, yeah. uh, but to me, from the user point of view, it's only any use to me 
if I get the feedback fairly quickly after the event so that I can learn from it. Yeah. So um, personally, I thought that all new newish smartphones had near field detectors. So and it's I, I, I'm not trying to be obstructive, Brenda. I can't keep up with all the phones and which have different capabilities and, and which don't. But you're right, it's, it, it, if you want to be able to uh, upload your pen at home, you do need a compatible smartphone. And um, I don't know, for instance, if Novo have a website with all the phones, because they will have problems keeping up with all the phones as they're being released as well. So most new smartphones and iPhones do have a near field detector. Some patients tell me that it doesn't seem to work anymore after a while and they might need to just up upgrade their phone. Um, but from Novo's point of view and from our point of view, we cannot keep up with all the phones. And, and that is a problem across the board. So that's why one of the things we mentioned was interoperability. So the pharma companies and the sensor companies are being pushed into sharing um, sharing their code and all the software behind it so that Dexcom will not just talk to tandem pumps. They've said, we don't mind partnering with Dana, which is the Cambridge system. They will also share the software with the Omnipod. Um, so within the next 12 months, I think this was one of the questions. I hope that within the next 12 months, people that are on an Omnipod patch pump will be able to close loop as well with the Dexcom. Um, it's just passed uh, the FDA, um, you know, they're both American companies. So the trial, the RCT has been looked at um, in, in America and has got passed. How long it'll take them to get through the UK and the European regulatory authority, I don't know. Um, is, there, is there anything in the short term? I mean, could I, for instance, every so often go into the hospital, take my take my pen in, say, could you download yes. this for me and let me have the data? Yes. Do because you want to do an appointment or? So we, we, we do have a, a appointment slots just for people to come in so they can download their meters or pens um, yeah. without having a, an actual appointment. So that's much easier at Northern General as we have a few more staff kicking around than at the Hampshire, which is a bit more, you know, general. Uh, outpatients as opposed to just the uh, diabetes center. Thank you. So if, um, if I'm going to Northern General, I can just phone up in advance and say, can I come in and, and download yeah. the pen? And yeah. ca can that get data get back to me? So then it'll go to the cloud, it'll go to your Diasend account, and you can access your Diasend account from home. Can't get to go to Libra then or anything like that? So this is this. Uh, thank you. It's a good question about the interoperability. Abbott are not playing very nicely at the minute. They're not being right. interoperable. So previously, Libra Data did go to Diasend, and then Abbott wanted to keep the data for themselves. They wanted to keep your data and everybody else's data um, on their cloud version. So at the minute, you can only view Libra Data on Libra View, which is run by Abbott they're not sharing their data. Another company, Medtronic, they do the same thing. They don't share their data. So these two companies are a bit of an outliers at the moment because all the other companies will play nicely with people like Diasend, who have been bought up by Cluco, and will share, their, will share your data with who you want to share it with. So again, I'm trying to support a, a, another regulatory board within the UK to say, actually, if you want something to be prescribable on the NHS, you need to share the data. So there's and lots of- We can of... get gas in now, can we? Through yes. Google. Is it Google? Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think there was just one question when somebody said, when will Libra 3 be available? Um, so Libra 3, um, we've been given a couple of free samples, so we've used it on a couple of youngsters that uh, have complex needs and um, don't remember to scan, let's put it that way. Um, so the Libra is kind of middle in price, it's not as much as a Dexcom, and it's a, but it's a bit more than a Libra 1, Libra 2. Um, but we, I know this sounds daft, 
we have problems getting the new the replacement sensors. So they've given us a handful of free samples, but they've made the system so complex for us to get replacement sensors to the patients, it's not workable at present. Mm. So for reasons best known to themselves, GPs cannot prescribe Libra 3. They've made it a job for the hospital, but then they've created layers and layers of bureaucracy that I've said, please go away and sort this out because it, it's just not worth the extra expense at the minute. So they're busy working on a solution to make it easier for us. It's much more convoluted than what we have to do for a Dexcom at the moment. It's ridiculous. Um, they're going away to sort themselves out. I can see there's a big thank you to the children's. Well done, Asta, your team there. Thank you, Asta, yes. <laughs> I think Anne is uh, raising her, her hand, Anne Moy. <laughs> I could see her on the screen. Hi there, Anne. Hi. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, I was interested in what you said, Jackie, about it. You, you implied it, it was the, um, uh, um, the companies such as Medtronic with their CGM. Um, which wouldn't play nice with the other companies and, and Lee Abbott as well. But I've got my doubts about whether it isn't actually all the pump companies, or even Tanda, um, who, who do this. Because um, Asta mentioned in Cambridge this system, and I use both that and the Dexcom um, uh, two slim system. And without a doubt, the Cambridge Artificial Pancreas System, which is available for tiny babies, <clears throat> it's in a league of its own as far as um, uh, hybrid closed loops go uh, in terms of times in range. But the only pump you can use it with is the Dana, which has to be the most awful pump on the planet. Um, and um, I can't wait to get rid of it. And I'm only on a, a, a relatively short trial. So I'm not sure that it is entirely the CGM companies. And I, I'd be inclined to call out the pump companies as well and say, come on, you need to play with everybody. So that's just my point of view. No, I th as you, you are right. And the, the FDA has gone further um, and they've said new products do need to be interoperable. So if we fast forward, hopefully not too long, let's say three years, what I hope for patients is that they can pick and choose which pump suits them best, which may or may not be a Dyna pump unless you've got brilliant eyesight. Um, you choose your sensor, which might be to do with where you're allowed to put it, where it's licensed on the body and accuracy and things like that. And, and you know, going back to what Brenda said, um, which phones it's compatible with, um, and then you get to you get to choose the algorithm. So the algorithm, what we mean by that is basically the thing that determines all the maths. Because um, from my understanding, Cambridge might have the best algorithm, but at the minute, they chose to go with Dana, which was. It might have been that Dana gave them money to help them produce their algorithm. I have no idea. Um, but moving forward, I think you and I, between us, would work out which pump would suit you best, which sense would suit you best, and which algorithm would suit you best. Because the algorithms be aren't all the algorithms aren't all the same, and also the trials have been done in slightly different populations, so it is quite difficult to know at the minute without a true head-to-head -head where somebody like yourself was randomized to one of the three different systems as to which system is best. Um, yeah. 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 Thank you. There's a couple of uh, questions in the chat box, Jackie. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one's... Um, from Emma who says, I guess a follow on question re smart pens is how do we move on to them? Um, and she doesn't want to wait until the next appointment, which is March 2023. Okay, that's fine. So, um, as you're a very special group, if you email 
um, Lindsay your details, then Lindsay can pass them on to me uh, and then we can make it happen. It might be that, you know, obviously I would need to look at your GP record. So by you asking for this, I just need to double check that you're on, you know, compatible insulins, but assuming that's okay, then I could just leave a couple of pens for you to collect in the diabetes center. Um, if, if you also need a change of insulin, um, then I could just say, you know, you've contacted me and um, please change the regular prescription. There's instructions in the box. It's really quite simple. So is that okay, Emma? Must be somewhere around. Hopefully. Oh, see her. Oh, oh yeah, she's still here. I can still see her. Is that right. okay with you, Emma? You're on mute. Hi, yeah, sorry, I've caught the uh, uh, COVID, so my throat's a bit poorly. Um, oh, yeah, that's fine. Um, could Lindsay pop her email in the chat? I'm sure Lindsay will be able to do that. Thank you. Thank um, you, Emma. There's a comment here about uh, Dexcom 1. So um, Dexcom 1 will be cheaper than Dexcom G6 and um, they've finally got their CE mark. Um, and just to let you know, I can't give you the details, but do look out and I will send Lynn's the details, but we are involved in a trial of Dexcom 1. So we will be looking for volunteers uh, for that. Uh, and that will help inform um, you know, which patients might benefit from this and help, hopefully help drive down the, the uh, cost. Um, okay. Lindsay has asked a question. It is, if you had type 1, what diabetes tech would you want? And if your child, nephew, niece had type 1, mm. what would you recommend they had? So that's for Jackie and Asta. Um, well, I had a, a chat to one of the finance people in the CCG um, earlier this week, and they're sweating because they're wondering if they ought to be literally spending the money on nursing homes or pumps and CGM. So I explained very briefly the, the benefits, um, that it is totally life-changing. Um, and this lady who I'd not met before, but you know, she's peri 40. I don't know if she's got children or not, but I did say, if your child got this, then you would want them under the Sheffield children's team. You'd want them on a pump and you'd want them on uh, a closed loop because it is you know, the best treatment that we currently have. If um, I could only have one of those bits of kit, then uh, I would choose CGM over a pump um, because I think it protects you from hypoglycemia um, and out of the two is probably better value for money for the NHS. What would you do, Asta? Yeah, I think the same thing. So if, if I had a child or I think hybrid closed loop, diesel and pump with Dexcom, no doubt about it, because the results we've seen and quality of life for parents is just, game changer and if I were to choose just one device then yes either Dexcom or Libra for, and yeah I don't I think personally if, if I had diabetes I don't think I would go for pump <laughs> but that's just very personal Pe people who like like I've got very routine similar things I eat so you put yes Dexcom or Libra would be the choice the tech of choice <laughs> yeah um so um, in terms of just briefly going back to who gets closed loops first, um, I definitely think it should be children. There are 27 and a half thousand young people under the age of 18 with type one diabetes. There's 10 times as many adults um, with type one diabetes. So it makes it very difficult to say which adults get it. You know, you have to draw lines somewhere, but I, I think uh, offering it to children first is definitely the right thing. Um, I look after some people who, for instance, have had terrible teenage years, uh, been abused or parents split up 
or not had much parenting and they've got complications of their diabetes in their 20s and 30s and they've never you know had a decent relationship because they're messed up with their diabetes or they're in eye clinic or we've got a girl under 30 who is currently being teed up for dialysis so it's it's just it's a horrible cruel disease and there are difficult decisions to be made but um yeah I, I would I would wholeheartedly support the money if there's a finite amount of money going to Astor's patients um, above the patients that I look after because it just stops the damage um, and stops stops the normal development of being in school doing normal things um, you know whether you've got good parenting or not really it gives them a chance. And another question is, uh, can GPs prescribe the smart insulin pens? Uh, yes, as from June, I think. So um, it's, GP computer systems have to get up to date with, um, you know, the different, they're called PIP codes. Everything that they prescribe has a PIP code. Um, and to get that onto the computer systems takes a while. So at the minute, it'll be from the diabetes uh, centres, um, and I know Astor's, you know, that they're giving them out to the children as well. Um, and the, the company um, are happily giving us the pens for free in the same way as they give us meters for free. Right. Um, there was another question that came from Eventbrite, which is um, technology doesn't always make things easier. My grandson has a Dexcom, but his AccuCheck pump will not accept input readings from it and still requires finger pricking. Why is this? Yeah, and that's to do with um, just the Dexcom doesn't talk to all different pumps and his so his pump, I think, is um, not going to be made anymore. So that pump company has decided not to make those pumps anymore. So they've not then invested uh, their time and energy in working out how to make it into a closed loop. So perhaps they need to have a chat to ask her about the type of pump that is on. Right. <laughs> I think there's another one lower down is, um, is L3 compatible with TS? Is it tea slim or um, it? yeah, not not commercially. Right. Um, there's there's no commercial version that talk, talks to a Libra at present. Trials are ongoing, then it has to get through the regulatory things. Um, um, there's some D or Paul has said that Libra one and Libra two were user for several years. And he believes that the Dexcom one is being launched on the NHS in May. Oh. Yeah, and again, we haven't got a price for that. So, and when they say launched on the NHS, we don't know if that's via hospitals or GPs yet. So the, there's quite a bit to be yes. detailed that, that is missing at the moment. I think that's... Um, there was a question about follow for Dexcom 1. My understanding is that it, it uh, doesn't have the follow feature on it. Um, what they're trying to do is produce a product that is cheaper than the G6, G7. It, it's not designed to be interoperable with different pumps. That's a different series. Dexcom 1 is meant to be a cheap and cheerful functional uh, CGM a bit like Libra um, because keeping the apps up to date um, is really expensive for these tech companies so if you have a sensor that doesn't need to do quite as much that helps them um, have software that's compatible with a wide range of phones at a lower cost. It's a question again from Emma. Mm -hmm. uh, it's quite a long one. Uh, one of my questions was around was around if the pump criteria will be looked at. And uh, she says I have very tight control with a HBA1C of forty one for years, but 
uh, mental health and obsession with numbers isn't great and think a pump might help relieve this, but I don't even have an option of a trial. So other consideration is, would the Novo Echo Pen 6 become available? And it has an FC transfer to log injections, which might help relieve the mental load. Mm. And I think it is is really difficult. For, it's difficult for anybody with uh, diabetes that, that's making lots of decisions every single day. Um, and it's difficult not to get um, a bit obsessive about the numbers and a bit obsessive around food. Um, and then society as a whole has, has got to think, well, how much do we want to pay um, collectively to make lives of people with diabetes easier. Um, so the, the question about pumps is it would be great if pumps were cheaper because uh, that would mean that more people could have access to it. It would be great if it was a bit easier to teach people how to use them and to teach healthcare professionals to teach you guys how to use them. So that's the kind of thing that the companies are working on, trying to simplify them as much as they can and uh, to drive the prices down. But you're right, at the minute, the, the criteria for pump therapy is that you ha have high HbA1c that isn't coming down despite everything else, or if you're having a severe hypose, it doesn't really talk about the mental burden um, of diabetes and the NHS as a whole hasn't quite figured out how to cost that in, but they are looking at that kind of thing within the closed loop pilot. So they are beginning to wake up to the fact that people on a, a closed loop system do not have to uh, think about their <coughs> diabetes so much during the day and it does decrease the burden. So that message I think will come through loud and clear um, and it might be that moving forward the policy makers and the people that hold the purse strings will value that more highly. There's another question for you Jackie, um, what do you hope will be the next big technological advance in diabetes management? Um, a tiny pump and a tiny sensor that people don't mind wearing that's really op easy to operate and it's cheap. Right, yes. <laughs> Microscopic, that's what you're aiming for. Yeah, so, well, I, I don't think that that really put, I don't think the size puts <laughs> many people off, but it does put yeah. some people off. Um, but something that's really easy to operate, easy to teach, easy to alter. Yeah, yeah. and generally the pumps have got better around that. Um, but th there are some things, you know, we just need as uh, David suggested, we need things that use less plastic as well. Yeah. So, you know, easier insertion devices and stuff like that. There's, there's lots of mileage for, and people are trying to engineer better solutions. Um, uh, the, there's it's a very specific question here about a four year warranty. Um, the good news is that if you're on an Omnipod, it doesn't cost the NHS much at all if you want to switch because of the pricing structure of Omnipod. So if um, if you wanted to switch off the Omnipod, the NHS doesn't lose any money because the most of the money is in the consumables. It's the patch that you put on every three days. The handset is minimal compared to the cost of a traditional tube pump. Um, in terms of the four-year warranty, um, if you've just been bought a new pump and you've just started a new pump, then you, a uh, tubed pump, you are routinely then looked at in four years' time in terms of changing pumps. But So if you're in that cycle, I wouldn't worry too much because I think the options by the time you come for an upgrade in two, three years' time will be a lot broader. Um, and you'll be offered a, a wider choice and then you can think about, well, either I'm going to get funded by the NHS to um, be on a hybrid closed loop or I'll have that sensor over there because it is 
cheap enough for me to be able to afford to loop. <laughs> there's, there's another question that um, I, I found quite I don't interesting. Know, really. uh, it's uh, it says um, the information about tech and diabetes available to GPs, diabetes nurses, and health trainers. Um, because Lindsay's put this that when she saw a health trainer, she was extremely grateful well, for details on the apps I used. Too, well. And um, I had the same experience, I had a health trainer and I showed her the apps I used, and uh, she was she was amazed because she hadn't seen those. I was just uh, uh, muting myself. So a um, couple of, you know, good points. So in July, um, we've got chance to speak to GPs across the whole of Sheffield. So sometimes when your GP won't see you, it's because they're having training. And um, on the 13th of July, uh, they're going to be invited to some diabetes training. And uh, so what we're going to do on that day is update them with some of the information I've given you today, um, but also get them to understand more about Libras. So the information is there, Shirley. The problem is your GP and your health trainers are swamped by medical information and they don't know which bit to look at. So you guys, as I think we discussed last year, will always be the experts on apps because there are hundreds and thousands of apps. So they will get to hear from you which app you like, and then they might see uh, somebody like David or Vanessa next time, and they say, oh, and they name their favorite app, and eventually maybe the same app is mentioned several times, which is how I get to hear about apps. And so I say, well, I've got lots of patients using this app over here. Why don't you try that? So, it is difficult because apps are forever changing and also yeah. that they change their pricing structure, don't they? So sometimes they're free and then you turn around six months later and they want a massive subscription. Um, so um, we do our best to update the GPs, but you have to realise they're being swamped by every specialty yeah. in medicine getting more complicated. So um, you guys attending this kind of um, session will always be more up to date than your GP. Good. Not sure if there's anything else we've got to look through. So I'm just going to ask, is there any other questions? Because uh, we're going to close down the question and answer time. Brenda, that was a hand up. I saw that, Brenda. Off you go. We'll, we'll let you have this last one. I've just put one in the chat, actually. Is there any move towards let it uh, change in, for instance, Libra? Uh, I don't know whether it applies to the others. It won't let me go in and change something retrospectively, um, which is really annoying because the problem is if I if I use my Nova Pen 6 and realise that I haven't actually injected what I'd put into my Libra, I, it then means that the active insulin is completely, not only is it unreliable, it's really dangerous, um, you know, because it's, it's telling me a wrong situation. Yeah, um, I don't think... Abbott uh, have got any plans like that um, uh, yeah. but also they don't really ask our opinion to be honest so some companies are good at asking you know in your opinion Jackie you know you see hundreds of people with diabetes what do you think the features are that they might like Abbott don't even ask yeah. so uh, it, it is quite difficult um, you can obviously you know tweet and, and put posts about that kind of thing um, to say you know it would be a useful you think it would be a useful feature but they're a law unto themselves what they will do with their software so you know it, it is a really good product it's really helped loads and loads of people mm. and i do want loads more people to do it is it perfect no oh but i agree it's, it's, it's good it's, yeah, it's pr it's pretty darn good yeah see the time getting along if we haven't um asked your question then we're quite happy to forward it on to jackie or asta and uh, get a reply and we'll sort of send it back to you but i want to thank asta and jackie for giving up their time to come and uh, talk to our group 
Um, I also want to remind everybody about uh, the meeting on Thursday, the 19th of May, which is about being diagnosed. And it's with Zina Muftin. So everybody's welcome to come along and listen to that. So I want to wish everybody a really good rest of the week. And I hope that everybody keeps safe and well. And if you've got COVID, I hope you feel better soon. Can I just give a, a shout out for your next one? Yes. Zena is a brilliant clinical psychologist. We've worked with various people over the years and she really understands the, the burden of living with diabetes. So. Perhaps she could help me with the uh, diabetes burnout <laughs> that I yeah. learned about the other night. Yeah, <laughs> definitely I, put what, that in the chat to her. <laughs> yeah, and when I looked at all the questions, I thought, well, that's me. <laughs> so I've got diabetes distress. You learn something new every day. But thank you, Jackie and Asta. Thank you for asking us. Yes, yeah. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks. Thank All right, thank you. Yeah. So bye bye everyone. I hope to see you next month. Bye.